Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Battle Report. In this game we're playing Yuqing versus the Merovingian Rapid Response Force, and the scenario is Supremacy. Now this is the list that I'm playing this evening, and you'll note this is a reinforcements list, but we are not playing a reinforcements mirror in this case. I am playing a 350 or 349 point Yuqing reinforcements list against 300 points of pure MRRF. This is something that I've been wanting to experiment with for a little while now. I did some experimentation with this before reinforcements actually dropped, but having now had a few reinforcements games under my belt, what I'm finding I crave is actually asymmetry. Uh, if you want to hear me talk about that, then the most recent Loss of Lieutenant episode, episode 100, I'm a guest on that. You can find it on YouTube. And I have a whole section where, among other things, I talk about reinforcements. But in short, what I'm finding with reinforcements is that the mirror match in reinforcements is rapidly running out of novelty. What I want from, basically from games generally, is a test of asymmetric strengths. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean an asymmetric focused list, like I only like playing Masai Moran Nomad hacking, but what I like is when two armies are different and you're testing those differences. You're playing, each player is trying to leverage the things about those armies that are different. And if you ever talk to kind of anyone or just think about your own thoughts on games, how many players do you find that love playing the mirror match in any kind of game? How many how many Song of Ice and Fire players love the mirror match? How many Infinity players, Combined Army, Yuqing, Panoceania, love, well actually Panoceanian players probably love the mirror match. But anyway, the point being that when you are testing symmetrical strengths against one another, you are more likely to have a situation where the game isn't actually determined by interesting decision making. And that's what you want. You want a game that is determined by interesting decision making. And that's enabled by having lists that have very different strengths. Uh, and in that, in that vein, I am therefore playing reinforcements versus non-reinforcements because I want to test it. I want to try it out, and it's an opportunity to really test lists with very different strengths against one another. The 300-point list is fully front-loaded. The 350-point list has to wait until the end of the game most of the time for its whole force to arrive. So that's super cool. And this is the Yuqing list that I'm playing in basically a game in that format. As with most reinforcement lists, because it is starting the game with only 250 points on the table, it has to kind of make do with a little. And in that vein, I have probably what is kind of a risky lieutenant choice in the Yan Ho lieutenant. Otherwise, though, this is a real selection of Yuqing good stuff. We have a Sujan, which is excellent, a Liberto. We have a selection of Quangxi, only three. I didn't have the troop slots for more. We have a Shaolin monk. We have the necessary Zanxi in order to enable the comlink for reinforcements. I still have opinions about comlinks, but for the purposes of playing reinforcements versus non-reinforcements, I don't want to play reinforcements where I have tinkered with the rules versus regular 300 points. That starts feeling like it's... Listen to also that if you like my opinions on that sort of thing. So we've got the Zanshi in here. We have Lankai because he is exceptional. We have some Longya because as with many, many cases, part of the objective is to not die. And especially when I am facing the risk of playing a 250 point, 13 trooper list, potentially getting alpha struck by a full 300 point list, lots of this list has to be focused on defense. And so in large part there, what we have is we have Longyars, we have Mine Layers, we have the Libertos, we have Quangxi as corner guards, because we are trying to not die. And then to attack, we have a Yanhuo for Overwatch, and then a Sujan. We have potentially an 11 order Sujan with the new 012 prestige rule. So basically the only thing that this list is notably lacking is that we are playing Supremacy and it's a little short on specialists. In fact, it's got three. It's got the Zanshi Comlink, it's got the Guilang Hacker, and the Guilang Hacker is literally only there in order to let me play Supremacy a little bit better. And then Bishia in the reinforcements. Speaking of the reinforcements, we have Bishia, who is excellent. The new Heite, uh, with heavy rocket launcher, plus one burst, and assault pistol, which is excellent. And the Huarang, which is excellent and enables this to form a three model Harris. So when this tr when this list, uh, this little Harris team appears, it will have one NCO, one tactical awareness, three regular orders for five, up to six with the Zanshi, up to seven with O12 prestige, and that's seven orders to spend on this little combat group turning up and doing some work, that's pretty good. As with most of my reinforcements games to date, all I am expecting this trio to do is arrive on turn three and accomplish some mission objectives, but that's all that they have to do. If they can do that in a way that wins me the game, then they've potentially won me the game. Now, having actually played through this list, if I was going to change one thing, the Guilang was there because in Supremacy, 
uh, having a specialist who can start really on a button and then quickly move to another button is pretty valuable. But Guilang are bad, and I will fight you if you just... No, okay. uh, they have never performed very well for me. Guilang have been consistent underperformers, and although this one would do totally okay in this game, it would not do anything that was particularly spectacular, and for the exact same cost, I could get a Whip 14 Hacker Pheasant Rank. And the thing about a Pheasant Rank is that apart from being a hacker that's doable with, say, the Sujan, it's got Chain of Command. And I'm kind of running a risk with this list where I have a very visible lieutenant who has to fight. Now, I like Yan Huo a lot, but I will not argue with the idea that maybe there should be a plan B for if he dies. Nevertheless, this list is doing a lot with 250 points with a good 100-point reinforcement pool. I'm pretty happy with it. Let's see what it's playing against. So this is the MRLF list that my opponent Rudy is playing with. Rudy is one of my Canberra locals. I don't think you've seen many um, games against him. Um, he's in and out occasionally, but he is a, just a genuinely wonderful, like lovely person. Um, and that's actually why I'm not playing Combined Army this uh, this game, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, because Rudy did not deserve that level of bullshit. But I like this list a lot. MRF have always been a faction that are they are a bit behind the power curve. They struggle a little bit with like lack of like, powerful technology uh, and like like a lot of single wounds, zero BTS, low armor. It's difficult to make an MRLF list that really has like an absolute ton of stuff going on. But there are some really interesting things going on here. So in terms of how the list is built, we have a three trooper Harris, uh, a Lugru Gru viral sniper, which I believe is a new profile, Wolfgang Wolf, and an Apache. Now, as far as Harris teams go, that's that's kind of baller. Like this is only a 0.5 SWC viral sniper rifle, which it's only ballistic skill 12, but it's a burst three viral sniper, and it's paired with a burst five multi rifle, and then a burst uh, four chain rifle, and heavy pistol. Like this, this is this team can close assault. The only thing that it's missing, and wants like one of the things that MRRF is kind of missing generally, is if either of these two pieces, the Apache or Wolfgang, had smoke, this would be an incredible, or uh, always a specialist, actually, to be perfectly honest. But this is an incredible little Harris team. Then on top of that, we have uh, Bruat, who is, for relatively cheap cost, an excellent midfielder with an AP Spitfire, and this is going to be a bit of a theme. We have one of two Chasseurs. This one is a Forward Observer. This one is a Mine Layer. We have uh, a Metro, a decoy, decoy Metro, a Zouave Forward Observer. For 21 points, starting in the midfield with Doggard, a Panzerfaust, and an Assault Pistol, and a Rifle, nothing wrong with Zouaves. They are very MRRF in the sense that, like, it's a single wound model, but Dogger does help. Then we have a Paracommando with an AP Spitfire and Nalf. So if you look at the guns that's going on in this list, the list manages to fit. So we've also got, sorry, a Zouave Sapper Sniper. Again, not an expensive piece. If you could find the points to make it a HMG, there's kind of an argument for it because the list actually does somehow have SWC after having two AP Spitfires and three Snipers. Um, well, that's what I like about this list is that it's got just like Sniper, 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 AP Spitfire, AP Spitfire. And the Snipers are, there's one regular Sniper, but one of them is Nalf and one of them is a linked Viral Sniper. So what the list doesn't have is resilience. It's got kind of almost as many wounds as you can pack into an MRRF list, where you've got Wolfgang, who is two wounds, and Apache, who is no wounding cap. And then you've got two Zwarves who are dogged. Um, but then that's sort of the limit to how much resilience you can build in. However, there is a mine. The, um, the Chasseurs are perfectly serviceable midfield skirmishers. Not great anymore, but good. And then there's even a Metro with a Panzerfaust. So um, what the list... like the, the list is just kind of really nicely well-rounded. It's got plenty of... If it needs to fight a tag, it can absolutely fight a tag. If it needs to move in and do things, it can absolutely do things. It's got plenty of specialists. What it is ultimately missing is it would really like some smoke because its close assault pieces are definitely stronger than its range pieces. Like, Nalf is very good, but he's failure... He's, like, not failure tolerant. So it would really like some smoke other than the single uh, smoke grenade launcher on the 112. Um, and... It's what it would also like is some kind of go for the throat ability, where if you look at the pieces, these are pieces that are very good at doing work over the course of the game. The para commando is going to want to turn up, like not necessarily on the first turn. Bruant is not like a run into the enemy deployment zone pace. This Harris team can kind of run into the opponent's deployment zone, but that's still a lot of points and force that necessarily, like they've only got nine orders because this is a nine five split, which I will talk about. Um, really this list wants to fake the opponent into letting it go second, kind of survive an alpha, 
and it will survive an alpha with its elements intact because there's just too much stuff here. There are too many guns and too many like useful elements to have all of them stripped away by an enemy alpha strike and then counterattack and kind of play the mission. And that is Rudy's style. The last point to note is that this list is intentionally playing 14 troopers. And um, if if you've been paying sort of attention to the reinforcements discussions and stuff like that, I may have mentioned either on the channel or I think on the Corvus Belly forums in the feedback thread that our local MRF player, and that's Rudy, doesn't necessarily like the fact that the reinforcement groups are public information because um, Mago and Duroc are a pretty good piece. It's a bit of an argument around how good they are, which I was, I was, I had just thought they were excellent, but Rudy's made the point that because reinforcements basically always stand up on turn three, they're mostly a mission secured kind of piece, they usually only need to kill like one thing really significantly, and you can do that with an Apache. You don't need Margo and Duroc necessarily to kill whatever it is you want your reinforcements to kill. They should be focusing on mission secured ground support, you know, killing one thing. You don't need the full panoply of Margo and Duroc to do that, but they are nevertheless very good and if he takes them in his reinforcements, then his opponent knows that he doesn't have them in his main list. And he finds it really valuable to project the threat of Margo and Duroc in the main list, because then your opponent does certain things, which we'll see in this game. Uh, and so what he's doing here is, yes, he has he has one para commando with an AP Spitfire, and then he's playing 14 troopers. So that like, the first turn begins, and it's really obvious that he's generating 13 orders. There, there are two missing. And that leads you to the conclusion as his opponent that like, oh crap, Margo and Duroc are turning up. And that changes how you play. And because that changes how you play, he likes to leverage that. And that I think is really clever. Like 14 troops, it's just like when a math player chooses to play 14 troops, even if they spent 300 points. Because then you spend the whole game being like, have I miscounted? Is there a bloody Rassiat turning up? And I like that. I like that kind of head game. That kind of head game is harder and harder to find in N4 than it was in N3 because of like the, the combat group limits and stuff like that. So when you can make it work for you, it's a sweet moment. Anyway, I like this list. It is still a French list, but I like this list a lot. Let's look at the table and see how it played. So here we are. We have uh, one of the usual game store tables set up. Um, I like quite like how this has come together. Rudy has won the LT roll with his whip 12 to my whip 13, and he has elected to deploy second on this side of the table here. Now, at this point, I decide to take a risk. I would not usually choose to go second, just barefaced go second into this kind of a situation. But one, I'm not exactly sure, like there's no individual piece in MRRF that I am worried about running across the table and killing my entire army. Two, my army is kitted out pretty well for defense. And three, I'm playing reinforcements, I have a safety net, and supremacy is a scenario that I increasingly just find easier to play. When you look, I absolutely can play scenario, play, play supremacy going first, but how you play supremacy going first is you annihilate your opponent. You put them into the dirt hard on the first turn. Now, can my list do that? Yes, it has an 11 order Sujan. Absolutely, it can do that. But. It's risky, and all it's got is that 11 order Sujan. And if there's something that stops that, I mean, MRRF has no hackers, but if something stalls that out, then I could be in serious trouble. Um, and also, I mean, I just don't want to do that all the time. I, I don't want to have to play a game where I must annihilate my opponent. I really enjoy playing second and playing to scenario. It, it's like, it's just nice to do that sometimes. So I have hard selected second turn, which means that Rudy is deploying second with full knowledge of my deployments, but I think that's actually going to be okay. Because of the pieces that I'm using, because of things like the Long Yars and the Shu, the um, Kuang Shu, I am relatively comfortable setting up a deployment for them that will be okay, and here's how that deployment went. So we have uh, the Guilang is deployed prone here. It's not exactly intending to present out a hacking network, I just want it to be safe and it can get through the out of the building through this uh, doorway here and so it can run that way and then that way to the two objectives. We have a long yard here with its mine here. The mine is super obvious, but I just want the mine in this position holding this territory. My QAZ creature is actually deployed here, not anywhere near Rudy's half of the table. And that's because I want it defending. I want it defending kind of like this space here. It's just more useful to me there. One of the things that I think is interesting, when QAZ creatures, when we first saw those, which was not very far ago now, there was this immediate like, oh, I will just bracket my opponent's deployment zone with them. But I don't actually know if that's necessarily correct. Like the thing about putting a QAZ creature right on your opponent's DZ is that then your opponent can just deploy to kill it with a CC expert. 
And a CC expert will typically kill a QAZ creature kind of easily, which then just removes the threat. Whereas, like, say I have a Sujan, for example, and the QAZ creature is nowhere near my deployment zone, but it is protecting your opponent's deployment zone, then it becomes more difficult necessarily to pick out. And I like that. So I think I think the initial impression that you should really aggressively push these creatures, probably not necessarily actually correct. There'll be an art to finding where to deploy those. Uh, Rudy's is deployed down here, so that's going to be projecting kind of like a zone. So we've got sort of like QAZ creatures there and there, and his will certainly do more work than mine, but we'll get to why that is the case. The Sujan is deployed prone on this rooftop here. I, in particular, I've made sure that it can't be seen from this rooftop. We have the second long yard -ya here, and what it's doing is it's actually found a spot where it can see my most of my back line and down this line here, and a little bit up there. This is the one with the shotgun. I really like shotguns on long yards, but you also want some mine layers. And it's watching the backfield because there is the threat of Margo and Duroc, because I've seen at this point none of Rudy's deployment. Otherwise, we just have Quang Shi scattered around, uh, and then we have the Shaolin Monk down here and Liang Kai down here. Those are in this position there because I want them to be able to move through this space and then ideally kill the QAZ creature that Rudy has deployed here, um, just so that I can have it out of the way. Now, what I was talking about before, combined army were a faction that I would like to play in a scenario with a QAZ beast at some point, because although a QAZ beast is a deployable weapon, it's got wounds, and that means that you can Prothean it, as far as I'm aware. And the idea of having something like Sheshkin just walk into the midfield and eat it as a snack and get to three wounds, or an Umbra Samaritan, is appealing to me. I like that idea. Um, but I wanted to play some Yuching. Uh, on the Lost Lieutenant episode, I talked about playing Yuching reinforcements, and so we're doing that this evening. Uh, my reserve drop will be my Yan Ho, which will pop down here. Again, it's basically on the back table edge. There's exactly space for it behind this little bit of terrain here. And that's one more thing, just watching for Margo and Duroc. And the reason why I do that is that after Rudy has deployed all of his stuff, I sort of detect that there is a threat of Margo and Duroc. Uh, for his part, Rudy is going to deploy in this building here. There will be a Zouave. There will be two camouflage markers, one here and one here, that looks like a Chasseur mine layer, but is actually Bruant and the Forward Observer... Um, um, chasseur. We then have the metro is deployed down here, like on a car. Uh, there's a zouave in here. There's the mine layer and mine um, chasseur over here and here. Then we have the Harris team, which has the viral sniper on this rooftop. Metros are just hanging around kind of in this space here and here. And then the sniper has gone down there. And this is a really lovely position that you can get sometimes with snipers that are forward deploying or infiltrating, where there's this long line up the table there that you could never get with uh, a deployment zone deployed sniper. But with the Zouave, it's actually deploying to see this marker here. It's completely pinning off like my Shaolin Monk if it wants to impetuous. Lang Kai can get past, only just. Um, so I really like that. I think that's really cool. And it's just like, like this is a 25 point half an SWC model that has the potential to do some really cool stuff. So Rudy is going first. Um, I've taken that particular risk, but I do think it will pay off. And he's got nine orders in one combat group and five... No, sorry, because he, he hasn't got the, um, the parachutist on yet. He's got eight orders in one group and five in the second. Now, I think about taking away from the five, but I figure I can just... If I take away from the combat group of of eight, he has six and five orders, and it's going to be pretty hard. Like, if, even if he's got Margo and Duroc turning up, it's going to be pretty hard to really, like, put the boot into me with that order split. And that is the weakness. Like, Rudy was really hoping to go second, and so I've scuppered him pretty hard by choosing to just go second myself. And so what he does, kind of, he makes the assessment and he figures out it's going to be pretty difficult for him to do a ton of damage, and so he makes the scenario play. And you never want to, like, you don't want to do this in Supremacy, because your opponent just has so much capacity to then counter position and just take zones with like the you know the, the minimum acceptable number of forces but he's made the call that it's what he has to do and fair enough so on the top flank basically on, on this part of the table here this suave is going to start in contact with the button or a millimeter away move around press the button successfully move around to here press the button successfully and move up to here, and it'll just hunker down there, being points in zones. I think if he'd had more orders, it'd probably have been better to maybe pull the Zouave back, but there is okay. And then over here, he's going to shoot and destroy the mine with the um, the x Visor sniper, with the sniper, the, um, sniper rifle, and then he's going to move uh, this Chasseur up and around, it's got clear space now. It's basically just going to lay some mines and be an asshole. Um, its point is to pin back, it, it wants to bait out the um, long yard, but I don't give it the satisfaction. What it's trying to do basically is pin back the Quang Shi so that I can't necessarily easily move into position. So 
there's a little bit of movement around. It sort of he tries to he sort of sees if I'll if I'll give him a shot, if I'll like reveal this long yarn so they can kill it with either of these pieces, but I don't, so he just ends up somewhere around here, re-camouflaged, having placed a mine. So then it's my turn, and because I'm going second in supremacy, that then gives me kind of the luxury of just doing what I think I need to do in order to score the scenario. So we do a few things here. We can't Impetuous the Shaolin Monk that's down here, but we can Impetuous Lang Kai, and this is a little bit of a risk because there's a Metro right here, and but the Metro is in the open relative to Lang Kai when he super jumps. So Lang Kai jumps up, the Metro Panzerfaust, Lang Kai flash pulses because it's just as good, and the Metro is in the open, and he flash pulses the Metro down, then he pauses for breath, and the Yan Ho spools up. So it's going to move up and around here. It's going to engage and destroy the Zouave. It's in a zero range band, but it can fight the Zouave at that range. It's only going to be, I'm going to be rolling eights. The Zouave's rolling twelves. I've got five dice. Zouave misses, and I just brute it straight to death. And then the Yanho is going to pop up to here. There's a door down there where it will see and to destroy the Metro. That's going to then free Lang Kai up, who will be able to uh, continue his path up and over here. And he's going to jump down and put the Zouave out of its misery. So nice, we've just gotten three kills, in fact, and we're, we haven't lost anything at this stage. So basically, things are going pretty well. What I now need to do is start securing zones. And what I note is that with the uh, the Chasseur here and the Zouave dead, Rudy actually doesn't have anything in this zone here. Uh, Nalf himself is deployed basically down here, in the or down here in the DZ, which means that I'm in a pretty good position to potentially secure these zones and this zone to get the majority. So what we do though is we still need to we'll keep pushing and we move Lang Kai forward and I want to deal with the QAZ creature. I want to deal with the Quazi Quitter. Now, Lang Kai is very well positioned for this. He's CC 24 with martial arts, which means that he's rolling... The worst that he can roll is an 8, because he's on plus 7. And then the QAZ creature is CC 11, minus 3 for martial arts, which means that it crits on an 8, which means that the only bad outcome, no matter what Lang Kai rolls, the only bad outcome is if the QAZ creature crits. The QAZ creature crits, and Lang Kai dies, all the way to dead in one go. And that really sucks, but it is a thing that can happen. And the nature of... Like, the, these things are burst three in ARO. The chance of a crit on the three dice is, like, kind of high. It's not massive, particularly given if you think about the fact that Lang Kai crits on something like 13s. You know, a pretty good chance of killing the QAZ creature. Pretty low chance of dying, particularly given I'm no wounded cap. But I took a crit, failed both saves, and that was the end of that. Uh, so that, that took a really, really good turn and made it into a kind of average turn, but we're fine. We're still in an okay position. Um, the Guilang, I've got, uh, like, the Sujan is going to move out and around to here, just so that it's got, I've got more points in this zone than the, um, than the Chasseur, and the Guilang is going to come around and start moving this direction. Now, the Chasseur is going to hold, and the, um, ex the Viral Sniper is going to reveal. I'm going to get out of the Chasseur's line of fire. I will actually get discovered, but I'm within 16 at this point, which lets the Guilang then move in this direction, occupy this position here. Takes a gunfight with the, um, the Viral Sniper, and it's inconclusive. I hit, but it turns out that Lugaru's are armor 2. Against a combi rifle, it's going to be fine. It is fine. It holds its position, but the Guilang has gotten to safety. That's a pretty hair-raising moment because Guilangs have got crap ballistic skill at 11, so I'm rolling uh, a, a pretty paltry 3 dice 11 to 2 dice 8s, even if I've got range of the type of rifle, but we're okay, we get there, and I lay a mine. I actually then move, I move back up and around in order to see the, um, the Chasseur, uh, try and discover a shoot, doesn't succeed, I just get a mine down, and that's the end of that. So at the end of this turn, I'm going to score uh, two points for securing more zones, but I've gotten no buttons pressed and haven't done my classified, which is extreme prejudice. So Rudy begins his turn, and he's got two, two buttons pressed on the field. He wants to do a couple of things. He wants to ideally position forces to stop me from scoring easily, and then he wants to neutralize some of my offensive elements. Um, if he can, he wants to, be, he's got a He's got potentially a line on the standing Yan Ho, and then also I've got the Sujan here, which is not going to have an easy time necessarily avoiding all lines of fire. So the band for this particular job is going to be Nalf in the first instance. Nalf's in combat group two. He's going to move up and around here, and he's going to take a, this is like a 12-inch a fight with the Sujan, which puts a wound on the Sujan, and I guts out of line of fire to hold this position here. Uh, then the Chasseur is going to move up and around, put a shot into the, put three shots into the Sujan, um, but the Sujan is going to spang those. That's fine. 
now if we'll move around and engage the Yanho, and it will put the little wound on the Yanho, and the Yanho will drop prone. And with the Yanho dropping prone, that opens the gateway for the SAS, not the SAS, the paratrooper to move here, up and around this way here, and it will put its AP Spitfire into the Sujan, and it will put the Sujan all the way to dead. Uh, Rudy does not have enough orders to follow through, maybe for example, uh, popping up here and and shooting the um, shooting the Yanho, but I have at some point uh, definitely of the um, the Longya has been forced out at some point during this entire engagement. Uh, I think when the Shasu, so yeah, when the Shasu is making the attack run, and that lets the um, lets the Luguru spool up three dice and twelve is one dice on elevens, uh, and that puts the that puts the uh, long yard down. So we're sustaining casualties at this point. We've just lost uh, the the Sujan, which was the best piece that we had for gunning through the sort of the elements of Rudy's list, and we've lost the long yard and we've lost Lang Kai. But that is not enough points to put us down below the um, below the reinforcements threshold. So we're going to have to play one more turn uh, from sort of this starting point here. One more turn without reinforcements uh, and without the Sujan. But that's basically okay. Now, one of the things I'm going to make a mistake here, I'm going to forget how many points Nalf is. Um, Nalf is hanging out sort of down here. I'm not really in a position where I can get to him, and I will forget that the the Guilang is fewer points than he is. So the Guilang is going to, well, actually, first thing that happens is that I don't really take any Impetuous, um, because there's too many snipers in the way, and the uh, the Longyar is going to start moving around. Um, Oh, uh, that's what, sorry, that's what baited out. The, the long yard here was baited out when the, the biker tried to come around here. And I fired, inconclusive, but the long yard then went down. So the the Yanho is going to move up and around here. It's going to shoot the biker, which has occupied this position here. It's going to shoot it to death. And then it's going to move around further. And after a couple of face-to-face -face rolls, uh, it's going to put the... Um, the Luguru to death. So that's that's actually established quite a bit of firepower dominance for me. If I can just take care of other stuff, because if we think about it, we've just we've taken out one sniper, two sniper. Um, I'm feeling kind of okay because I don't actually 100% know where all of the other guns are. But surely that's all of them with this AP Spitfire having turned up, right? Surely that's all of them. Uh, so we're then going to have a Quangxi do Quangxi things. It's going to come around the corner. The Spitfire will dodge. I will pistol it to death. Lovely jubbly. And then I'm thinking, okay, we're fine. It's time to secure some zones. I will move the Guilang around. It's basically going to do a round trip between these two objectives that will end up prone here with a mine laid next to it. And I will I will take those two objectives. It is a Whip 14 hacker. It's very good at that. And then I kind of just, that's the game. That's the turn. And I think, yeah, cool. I've got a Guilang in this zone. I've got some stuff. I've got a Yanho in this zone. I got stuff in this zone. Oh, I'm going to score two points again. No, I'm not. The Guilang is not as expensive as Nalf. And Nalf has gotten forward here. I had kind of just sort of forgotten about him a little bit. So that's that's a little rip, but things are looking pretty good. Nalf is Nalf is one piece that might potentially put down the Yanho. Um, but it's just one piece. I, it's he's gonna to have to if Nalf wants to really move around and fight the Yanho, he risks having to engage my QAZ creature. And the Yanho is pinning down the Apache and Wolf really nicely. So this is looking like a pretty good turn. Uh, for all that I I am wounded, right? I am um, I have been wounded. The Yanho was wounded by the para, the para commando um, before I was able to put it down with the with the Kuang Shi. So all right, that's okay. Things are looking fine, and this is Rudy's last turn to do something. And I am I'm still up. I'm still up on points. I've got two objectives. He's got two objectives, and I've scored one. So it's pretty difficult for him to pull this back to a win. To do that, he actually has to score in the last round. And he needs to do his classified and press another button just so he's got a little bit of fat. So it's pretty challenging with the, the one turn of scoring and then one turn with no one scoring. I'm looking pretty good. Uh, but the obvious failure state is that the Yan Ho could die because it's the LT. And at that point, camouflage marker just begins, Rudy activates it and it just moves up and around here and up and up and around here. And it moves to see the Yan Ho. And I hold. And it's Bruant with an AP Spitfire. And he kills me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I knew this could happen. Not the end of the world. This is the risk that you run, right? Like the Yanho is going to die at some point because of this. And it's not the end of the world. And it's not the end of the world because I'm up on scoring. The Yanho has done its job. You can play through loss of lieutenant. Even if you have very few command tokens, which I didn't have many command tokens left because of O12 Prestige, I've been spending them. And Bruant just sort of like nestles down here. Uh, now, Rudy then moves, uh, he moves Nalf up to sort of this space here to occupy some space. And then this team is going to move forward, uh, dismounts the building and just kind of like occupies space around here, uh, dodging its way through this mine. 
but it's not able, it gets, uh, it gets hacked, it gets spotlit, and it just ends up kind of like hanging out near the Guilang with, with Wolf, because he just has to push forward. Now, you don't love doing that, but like what else is going to kill, the, the Guilang is not going to kill Wolf, Wolf will dodge into combat or something. So Rudy is sort of heavily occupying this position here, but all he's got over here is he's still got one, uh, one forward observer chasseur, and then um, he's gotten Bruant up into my zone. So, okay, I'm lost a lieutenant. That's fine. My reinforcements arrive and they're going to they're gonna pod down and they're going to land. I'm going to put the pod down here and I'm going to drop the Huarang there. So the Huarang there behind Bruant, uh, Bishia near the objective and the, um, the big guy with the rocket, I forget his name, in position to move into this zone because he's very expensive. Uh, so I'm going to do one thing in the impetuous phase. We're going to have this... Uh, this um, uh, Kuang Shi move into combat with the um, uh, blah, 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 what do you call it? The Para Commando. God, French names. Anyway, move into combat with the Para Commando, declare a CC attack, which is a coup de gras, and coup de gras does my objective, so I've done my classified. That's good. Over here, then, we just have to sort this problem out. We have to sort it out with very, very few orders. We don't have an NCO order. We do have tactical awareness on the big trooper, and Okay, that's fine. We're going to spend the irregular, the, tact the irregular loss of lieutenant order from the Huarang, and we're going to move into contact with Bruant. We've started in his back arc. We've moved into CC. We have an explosive CCW, CC 22, martial arts three. Um, Bruant, however, who has moved up over here in order to decharge this sign to do Rudy classified, uh, and Bruant has decharges, and Bruant crits with his decharges, and he blows up my Huarang. Just like, okay, that's fine. Like, it's fine. The, the big trooper is going to activate. It's already within inches of Bruant, uses tactical awareness, moves through over here. All I'm worried about is an AP Spitfire crit in bad range. And Rudy does not AP Spitfire crit in bad range. And I light him up with the Assault Pistol. The Assault Pistol actually takes him out. But even if I hadn't killed him, that would have gotten a 50-something point heavy trooper in this quadrant. And Bishia would still be in this quadrant. And that would be more than enough. Um, but with Bruant down, Bishia is able to uh, move over and press the button. And that gets me the third objective. So I've done all of my classifieds. I've pressed the three buttons. And I am now securing... Uh, these three zones here, here, and here, which will get me enough points to get to eight at the end of the game to uh, three for Rudy. Rudy was never able to press a third button and wasn't able to dominate any quadrants. Um, so that's that's how the game wraps up. Uh, there's a little bit of stuff that I could do. We did just sort of roll dice to see, was it possible for me to dominate a fourth quadrant? No, absolutely not. Bishia is able to like jump up here and get a back, like a back shot into Nauf on the rooftop because Bishia is awesome and very mobile, but it doesn't actually accomplish anything. It takes too many orders to do it and uh, she almost dies to the QAZ creature. So that's the end of the game. 8-3 to Yu Ching. Um, valiantly fought by MRRF, particularly given how difficult this was going to be for Rudy once I just hard chose to go second and he couldn't capitalize on that not every list can you know you do you need to plan to attack you need to plan to defend Rudy wanted to sort of build his list to defend and when he was just left with a position where he, he just couldn't put the boot into me there was always going to be sort of advantage me uh, I took a ton of casualties but it was totally okay to take those casualties because of the reinforcement safety blanket now how did I find reinforcements versus regular 300 points um I cannot overstate how much I enjoyed this compared to the reinforcements mirror um just that the the test of asymmetric strengths is so much more interesting now this was absolutely a scenario where I think going second with reinforcements was an excellent case it was an ideal case right but that's that is how if, if we run ITS events where we have reinforcements as optional yeah that's what will happen you'll have if you have a good mix of scenarios you will probably have players bring reinforcements for some not for others and a little bit of delta in between like as toha for example i think i would probably play reinforcements as one of my lists but i would use them relatively rarely as Hakizlam, I might feel comfortable using reinforcements quite a lot, sort of like less dependent on scenario. Um, it'll change. I think with combined army, I think I would just play 300 points most of the time because I do not like uh, the fact that combined army don't have a comlink plus X and their comlink profiles are expensive as balls. Um, I, I just, I would rather play 300 points combined army and just wear the risk, right? So uh, I, I am actually kind of thinking about maybe running the next event that I run as a reinforcements optional. No other changes. We're not going to ditz around with, like, like, everyone hates comlinks, but as they are and as they cost, but we're not going to ditz around with that. We're not going to ditz around with, like, changing reinforcements to private information. We're just going to play reinforcements 
out of the book, but it's optional on a per list basis. I'm kind of leaning toward that because this was fun. Um, I don't know if it was perfectly balanced. I know we won't know if it's perfectly balanced. I suspect that it's going to make the difference in terms of scenario. I think there are scenarios that will probably strongly favor reinforcements. But this was just much, much, much more interesting to play. Like the, the texture of play, the fact that like I had my eye on the late game and I just had to do certain things to secure the scenario in the knowledge that my reinforcements would arrive and score me some points. And they did, they arrived and scored me three points, which catapulted me from, well, five to eight, but still. Um, and whereas Rudy had to have like had to deal with the fact that he had more strength than me for the first two turns, but then I would have this advantage in the late game. That is just texturally way more interesting than the mirror. Um, and so I'm really glad I played this game. It was very enjoyable. It's always just an absolute treat to catch up with Rudy for games. Uh, and so this was, this was I'm going to do this some more. Um, I will not be putting in my titles of videos whether or not they were reinforcements. I will just cover that on a list-by-list -list basis. And yeah, interested to hear people's thoughts on that in the comments if you've gotten this far in the video. Otherwise, as always, if you like what I'm doing, you can support me via the Buy Me A Coffee link in this video's description. And otherwise, I will see you next time.